Hi everyone, how are we all doing today? Welcome to another FIA Championship video, the last one from the now concluded exhibition series. My name is Jure and in this video we're going to the USA, to Laguna Seca to be more precise. It's one of the most famous tracks in the world because of one of the most iconic corners, the corkscrew. Now, in case you're new to my channel, or even if you've been here before and still haven't subscribed, please consider to do so. It's completely free, free for you, but on the other hand, it helps grow the channel some more, which I would really appreciate. Anyway, this was the final round on the Nations Cup exhibition series, as we jump straight into qualifying, and I wanted to get a good result in this race, to try and stay within the top 200 racers in EMEA region. That would have been my best ever result in any season by far. I know a lot of drivers didn't really bother with this season, but anyway. As we can see, there are some familiar names in this lobby, a few people I've already raced with before, so I knew what to expect in this race in a way. Skipping ahead to the end of the warm-up lap, as you can see right now, we're getting ready to start our qualifying lap. We pretty much have this part of the circuit to ourselves at the moment, where we can see the Italian driver ahead going quite slowly as we're catching them up. That's actually very helpful down this main straight, since this is the only part on this circuit where slipstream actually comes in handy, as the rest of the circuit is a lot more twisty, apart from some short high-speed sections in the middle of the lap. Hitting our braking point a tiny bit early maybe, slowing the car down just a tad too soon I would say. Still a good line through this first section, although most of the time it was better to go a bit wide and pull the car back to put your foot down sooner and get the higher exit speed. But regardless, we continue with our lap. Yeah, about the cars. In this round we had two cars to choose from, the Porsche Cayman, which I'm using as well, and the Chevrolet Corvette. The Cayman was a much better choice for this track, since it's more of a handling car than the Corvette, but some people still preferred to go with that. Not many people to be honest, but there were some here and there, as you can see in front of us right now as well. Approaching the braking zone for the corkscrew now, going hard on the brakes at first and then ease off as we head towards the first apex. From there, it's all about managing your throttle inputs, as it's not hard to spin out on the exit due to such a massive drop, and you still have to turn the wheel to get ready for the next corner. Going around the final couple of corners, we're catching the Corvette ahead, right before the main straight again. Still have to get a good exit out of the final corner and head for the finish line. Looks like we managed to stay in the toe of the car ahead, so we got a bit lucky at the beginning and the end of our lap here. It looks like it was a good lap as we're in 5th position at the moment, but let's see where we will eventually end up as the session comes to a close. A few more drivers managed to set a better lap time, unfortunately I wasn't able to improve my time. Not for the lack of trying though, so we'll be starting the race in 10th position. We're going to take a quick look at the scoreboard now. I realized that if I finish 10th, it would bring me 150 points, but before this race my second highest was 175, so I was trying to score more than that this time. I'd have to finish at least 7th or higher to achieve that goal, because it would be really difficult to beat my personal best of 224. I won't say it's going to be impossible, since in this race anything can happen. Now, it's time for the Nations Cup intro and then straight into the race. And here we are, on the starting grid, waiting to go racing. You can see all of the cars ahead are the Caymans, which only proves my point that it was just the better car for this race. Luckily, we were put on the left side of the grid, which will give us the inside line for turn 1. 
you really didn't want to be on the outside of that corner in this race. Waiting for the lights to go out, and away we go, turning the traction control off as we don't need it anymore, just trying to stay to the left side of the track. The driver in front, the Sikas, also has a YouTube channel which you can check out on this link above. I get very close to the back of his car, trying not to hit him, but someone goes into the back of me and I couldn't really avoid hitting the Sikas and a few other drivers as well. It's all so tight going through this first sector, a lot of door banging going on as Rick goes past us on the inside. We finally manage to get ahead into P7, exactly what we need, and the race calms down at least a little bit at this point. Gaining 3 positions since the, since the start of the race isn't such a bad thing, especially as we do need to keep this 7th place. Since we're still in this quite a large group of cars, not so far away from the lead even, there's a good chance to try and get even more points. I can remember being quite nervous going through here, telling myself just calm down, relax, you're in a good position, and you know you can raise these guys. Eventually, I managed to, to calm down a little bit, especially when I saw that the cars behind here dropped back quite significantly and I could focus entirely on the pack ahead of me. Unfortunately, as you have seen, we were in P6 for a short while, but Rick got ahead of us again. The cars behind are now over a second away, that's quite a nice little gap I believe. Of course, we could make a mistake in one of the corners and they would catch right back up, so we have to stay focused and keep going around the circuit as fast as possible. Staying in the slipstream of the cars ahead will also help us get even further away from those behind us. Coming to the first corner again, we can see some fighting going on ahead. Maybe if someone went a bit too aggressive into any of the corners, pushing someone wide, we could get an easy position that way. That doesn't happen this time, but still a long race ahead of us though. We've talked about the cars before, now let's say a few words about the strategy in this race. As you can see in the bottom left corner, we're on the racing hard tires. So the strategy was that there was no strategy. You didn't have to change tires or refuel, but you did have to try and save as much tire life throughout the race as you possibly could by driving the Cayman very smoothly. The Cayman in general requires very smooth driving in on, in on its own, so it was kind of suited to my driving style in these kind of races, since I usually brake just a tiny bit earlier and not as hard, which does wonders to tire wear on a longer race like this. It is a 15 lap race, so we still have 13 laps left at the end of this one, still a long way to go. But as we skip ahead a lap, approaching corkscrew for the third time in this race, you'll see me get closer to the back of the car in front. Going through here, it feels like I went too wide following Matteo's lead. And there it is, the corner cutting penalty. It is weird how I got the penalty before Matteo, even though he was ahead of me going through the corner, but oh well. It's not a big penalty, just half a second, and the time loss in the penalty zone on this track isn't that bad anyway. As we come round this final corner, we can see that we're comfortably ahead of the cars behind, but they also have a penalty, so there's no worry of them catching up when we serve that penalty. Matteo looks very determined to get ahead of Alanter going into turn 1, just squeezing past down the inside and pushing both of them wide. Unfortunately, I realized what was going to happen a bit too late, so I couldn't slow down enough to get past both of them. As we speed ahead now, we're going to reach the penalty zone in just a second. Even if we did get ahead of anyone in that first corner, we would have had to give up at least one of the positions back. But P7 is still right where we want to be, so there's no point in pushing too hard and making a mistake somewhere. Jumping, a jumping ahead again, the Finnish driver got back past Matteo, and we're now more than 4.5 seconds away from those behind us. We got a better run through that left kink of turn 6 and get really close to the back of Matteo in this braking zone. Not giving up on going further up the grid of course. In the distance, we can see the British driver Rick, who we had a nice little battle in lap 1 with, get themselves a penalty as well. Now, they might be too far ahead to overtake them when they serve the penalty, but it will surely bring us closer together at least. Rounding up lap 6 at the moment, we just stay in the slipstream of the car ahead by the slightest of margins. Another tenth further back and we would have been out of it. Luckily, as I've said before, 
Slipstream doesn't play such a big part on this track as it does on some others. Even if you fall behind someone with a mistake like we just did for example, if you manage to get a better run through a couple of corners, you can quickly catch them back up. When you're roughly within 7.5 tenths behind the car in front of you, you are in their toe, for those of you that don't play this game. Or even if you do, you might not have known that. We're just on the edge of that here. Taking a look up ahead, Rick gets to save the penalty, and they all get very close together yet again. By this point, the two leaders have taken off, so P1 and P2 are basically out of reach. We can still see P3 there, but I'm guessing it would cost us too much time even if we managed to get past all three cars ahead of us. So it looks like we'll be fighting for P4 if it all stays like it is now. Like I said earlier, you just need a couple of corners on this track and in these cars to get right back up to someone. And you can see the prime example of that now as I get close to Matteo again. Unfortunately, I went on the brakes a bit too hard here and the rear of the car stepped out for a short moment. Nothing that wouldn't be manageable in the grand scheme of things, but it cost me a bit of time anyway. We skip ahead again into the second half of the race now. Still in P7, a bit further back from the car ahead than we were before, but that all goes up and down when you go around the circuit. Especially if the cars ahead start fighting like we see in front of us. We get closer to them right away, as they get very comfortable with each other, which only works in our favor at the moment. It's quite hard to overtake someone at this track anyway, but being in the same cars makes it that much harder. I mean, I don't know what it looked like at the back of the pack, but as you can see, not a lot has been going on in front of us in these 9 laps, with the exception of lap 1 of course. In these higher ranked lobbies, the pace between the drivers gets very similar, which produces such close racing. Of course, there are going to be some drivers that are faster than others, but the difference isn't as big as in some lower ranked lobbies. We're still stuck behind Matteo here, coming to the end of the lap now, but unfortunately I break a bit too late for this corner and run wide, losing about a second, which means no slipstream for us down the main straight that's coming up. As we can see ahead, Rick got a bit of a slower exit out of the final corner, and Matteo looks like he's going to get the move done this time around and get ahead but it could still get tasty between them down in turn 1 and maybe give us a chance to gain two positions at once, who knows? They give each other enough space, more than enough through there actually, so no luck for us. That's some clean racing right there. Although it looks like Rick isn't going to give up on P5 that easy at this point. Skipping ahead another lap, we can see that Matteo pulled away from Rick and myself and P4 is also quite far ahead already. We now have to keep pushing and put some pressure on the car right in front of us to maybe try and get ahead by the end of the race. Trying to go for a move into corkscrew would be really dangerous, launching it from so far back. But on the exit we can see that Rick gets a better run out of the corner and this was the case for a few laps now, as I was just trying to keep the car on the road and not push too hard to make me spin out. Rick runs a little wide here and I thought that this was the chance I needed. Need a good exit onto the main straight, tuck in the slipstream and get in front down at turn 1. It looks like we're falling slightly backwards even, not getting the advantage we would have wanted with slipstream, so things aren't exactly going to plan this time. Even more so, as you can see, we broke too late, so have to take avoiding action not to hit Rick. Fortunately, we don't lose that much time but it's still not the most ideal thing to do. Trying to stay as close to the car ahead as possible through this part of the lap, you can probably hear the tires dying of death in the background. You can also see how badly worn they are in the bottom left corner. Because this track runs anti-clockwise, the right hand side tires take much more of a beating than the left, so naturally they're going to be more worn out. But by the looks of it, Rick's tires are in an even worse shape and we get very close to each other at this point. This left kink is one of the trickiest corners to get right even on your own, let alone when you're following someone that closely. 
but we both get round safely and we continue with our battle. Once again, as we go through Corkscrew, take a look at how much time we're going to lose here. I tried to go on the throttle earlier, as early as I would have dared to, but I still kept losing a few tenths on the exit every single time, but luckily I managed to gain that time back over the rest of the lap. As we now jump ahead to the end of lap 13, so two more laps left at the end of this one, we can see that nothing really changed, still roughly the same distance between myself and the car in front, but as I've said before, looks like our tires are in a better shape as we can also see now. Getting really close to the back of this blue Cayman, but Rick does well to hawk the inside line, so we have to move to the right and try to go around the outside. Although at this point I thought maybe I could brake harder and get some kind of a cutback in the second part of the corner, but that didn't really work. Rick stopped perfectly on the first apex, closing the door right in my face, but to be fair, that's exactly what I would do too in this kind of situation. I know that there aren't many other overtaking places left in this lap, as Rick goes slightly defensive here, and I just move to the left to show him I'm still here and try to force him into a mistake, but this was all just preparation for the beginning of the final lap and the run down to turn 1 where I could try to get past again. Didn't really have any intention to go for a move into any of these last two corners, even less so into corkscrew coming up, so I was okay with staying behind here and use the slipstream down the main straight. Going through this iconic corner second to last time in this race, Rick once again gets a better exit, so we're going to have to catch up again by the time we get to the straight. Luckily we're still close enough and with that difference in grip, we can see that we're gaining on the car in front ever so slightly. Coming to the braking zone of the final corner, the difference is even more clear. With just one more lap to go, he decides to get on the left even sooner than in the previous lap, because if he stays ahead through turn 1, more than half of the job of defending P6 is done. Once again, we have to go on the outside, hoping for a different outcome than previously. But no, history repeats itself, and we're staying behind, well, for now at least. There's still some time left for some kind of a mistake, either from Rick or myself for that matter, so have to stay focused all the way to the end. Going through here, the difference in tire wear presents itself again. We get a much better run out of the corner, but unfortunately the next corner is a left-hander, so we're on the outside again. This was never going to work at this stage of the race, so I had to back out and hope for another chance later on in the lap. This is turning out to be quite an exciting battle for P6 in these last couple of laps. That's what makes racing so fun. Getting a better run out of the corner, we go side by side with Rick, and I wanted to outbreak him here. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out as I had hoped, and it looks like this might be a bit of a corner cut from us. Let's see, are we going to get... Yeah, there it is. So, at this point, I knew it was pretty much all over. Even if I was to get in front of Rick, I don't think I could pull away and get ahead by one second as the penalty rounds up at the line. I had a big enough gap behind, so there was no worry of falling down the order, so it'll be 7th position this time. And remember from the beginning, when I said that that is exactly what I needed, well, at least that, if not better. It was a great race in the grand scheme of things, looking back at it now. I don't think I could have done any better, I mean, you can always improve and do better, but I was still happy with this result anyway. Well, that will be all from me for this video. Thank you all very much for watching, and if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up, and feel free to subscribe to my channel if you like the content as well. Thank you to everyone that subscribed in the past few days and weeks, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care and goodbye.